All right, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's June 12th at 1 o'clock. We'll go ahead, If please keep the conversation down in the audience. Councillor, roll call. Councillor Young. Here. Councillor Belcott, I don't believe she's here. Uh, Councillor Mevigy. Present. Councillor Bowerman. Present. And Councillor Marshall. Here. Okay, any amendments to the agenda? Yes, uh, there is an amendment. It's 9.2 executive session. It'll be um, pending litigation for 10 minutes and possible after action. And that's RCW 4231101, small little i. Okay, so it's 9.2. We already, I already have that on my sheet. Well, I think online it doesn't show oh, oh. 9.2. All right. So, thank you. So I think. We were all aware of it coming. Um, I just wanted to make any sure. Any objection to adding that formally to the agenda? Okay, hearing none. And I've got 10 minutes for each with possible after action. All right, so uh, public comment on agenda items only. I know there's discussion we've had. Some fair amount of abuses uh, on going back to other minutes and then talking about every subject. Again, this isn't for open public comment. We have a fairly, um, hopefully fairly brief agenda today. So I know those dressed in red are here for a specific purpose. Um, about the only thing that the minutes sheet says is council engaged in a healthy discussion, which probably could have a little bit more detail to flesh out the discussion on the bridge uh, plan with the city of Vancouver. But I'm just gonna highlight that. Um, unless there's an objection by council, we'll hear the public comment uh, that's anticipated uh, because I think we do have a fairly light agenda today. And for all, everyone else, please, Remember the rules to keep it cordial and polite and not belittling and demeaning uh, to any staff or entity uh, and only focus on county business. Please stop clapping. Okay, who signed up? Um, there's no sign up. Okay, please step forward to state your name. Uh, push the button so you see a green light and you'll have three minutes for your okay. comment. So my name is Martha Meyer and I do wanna comment on the um, mental health sales tax that was part of the minute. So um, I think that's allowed um, and it's part of the bridge shelter. So um, first of all, I wanna say thank you for um, considering the bridge shelter and all the work that you do on behalf of those who are um, unhoused or have very low income and are have trouble um, finding shelter. Um, I've been particularly concerned, well, I'm concerned about affordable housing in general, especially for those who are very poor, um, but particularly concerned about the bridge shelter. Um, I know that that's come up here several times. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to people this past week about it from the city and the county and council for the homeless, and um, I am getting a whole lot of different perspectives. I guess I would just encourage you to do whatever you can to um, do that communication so we can move this forward. Um, I think it's very critical that we do the most we can um, to help the least of these. Um, I'm a Lutheran pastor, retired now. I worked at St. Andrew Lutheran Church for a number of years. We were home of the um, winter hospitality overflow shelter. We thought it was just going to be a short term thing. It's still there 25 years later. Um, I think of um, some of the images from that time, like um, you know the young kids that would sit in the lobby waiting for the school bus. Um, they slept in the gym all night and then um, somehow they were able to go to school and it made me proud of them, but it was just also very distressing. Um, I also have some personal experience. I've got a son with developmental disabilities. We've been trying to find him um, a housing situation for 13 years. We're fortunate we've been able to come up with something because of an inheritance, but I know that um, 
many, many people um, are not so fortunate. If you're on SSI, there is nowhere in the country where you can find housing for a third of your income. And so, um, again, because housing is so expensive, which is, which is why we have such a need for the affordable housing. And I think there's a particular need um, for the mental health services that go along with that. Um, the bridge shelter would provide 24-7 care. Um, and the mental health services that people need. And I think, especially for those coming out of jail, it will be the critical bridge from getting from that life to one of um, being a productive citizen. So again, thanks for your time and work on this issue. And again, I, um, I hope that we can move forward with a bridge shelter sooner rather than later, then you can get on to work in another affordable housing. Thanks. Thank you. And I was going to ask, because it was part of your our email correspondence, uh, and you mentioned the jail, um, you know, we've had that discussion many times of the claims of people being let out at every hour in the day. And um, I don't know if you're aware, but I was a judge and, and participated in that process of ordering the release of certain people. There's a lot of work going on right now and with the courts as well on the timing of when they do in custody is when they set bail, uh, when they order releases. Right now they're happening pretty late in the afternoon, which causes huge stress on the system from the clerks to the judicial assistants to them then processing it in the jail. So there is lag time and people are getting released at different hours. But we do have some clarity on those issues. Um, because one or two antidotes, antidotes, dodal releases at 2 a.m. or midnight or 10 is not the norm, nor is it sought after. And um, the other part of this is that, you know, if someone posts bail, whether they're homeless or not, they get released after they post bail, and no one has any control of that, and that can happen at any hour. But uh, Amber, did you want to just I would just summarize the data that you've absolutely. researched on that? Yeah, I would just uh, summarize because I just want to clarify because I know that the mayor made a comment at their city council meeting on Monday about the jail releasing at 2 a.m. and then just giving folks a tent. That is not the norm, like you said. That is not the um, what's happening. Um, most frequently, our release times typically happen between 5 p.m. and midnight. And like you said, Chair, that that's due to the court process happening late in the day. So um, we have that data available, and we're happy to share that with the city. But I just want to make sure that, as the jails brought up in conversation, that we are a partner. We absolutely think the bridge shelter is a great idea. That's nothing that we are saying in that regard. But I want to make sure when the jail is mentioned that it's it's mentioned in um, collaboration and not a point of contention that we're releasing people at 2 a.m., which is not the case all the time. So I look forward to, to the continuing discussion and also know that we, um, and I brought this up particularly, I came from another county where they had uh, nonprofits and church groups and other volunteer organizations that called themselves friends outside and actually provided help to those in custody, especially those that no longer were engaged with their family or had family nearby or rides or ensuring they got connected with Council for the Homeless or outreach in other ways. Uh, I don't think we have any organized effort like that here in Clark County, and that's a real shame. So uh, without further ado, um, next speaker, please state your name and your topic that's on the agenda. My name is Kimberly Goheen, Elvin, Patriot, Life Citizen of Clark County, Washington, USA. Pertaining to the minutes of June 5th, um, a report on policy issues, Jordan Boge, Senior Policy Analyst and an unelected employee of the public, he edited the legally submitted proclamation for July being uh, 24, the Independence Month, representing the uh, public citizens and submitted by myself and Carmen De, De Leon. I'm submitting the original proclamation to be put on record as I also did ask that to be done last week and it's not here so the people can read it. 
Um, I believe that the editing is illegal, unconstitutional, discriminatory, racist, and actively targeting me as an active patriot here in Clark County, Washington. I will be filing this official complaint to the Ethics Committee, adding to already ongoing ethics investigations into the Clark County Council. The edited version of independence means, and it's going to be cutting out. Is that AI or somebody physically doing it again? Yeah. Okay, I'm, just me? Okay. Uh, ma'am. So ethics ma'am. committee investigating. Ma'am, I don't think it's AI. I think it needs to Thank move you. away so from I, the mic time. a My little time bit. is very important. Thank you. Move the edited the mic version so we can hear you. of independence means is not represented in my written intent of independence month and has been slandered and ignored with such editing. Jordan Bode, God bless him, uh, is not elected and he has no authority over me and this original proclamation. And this council must make a motion to end the old business as originally written the independence month and discard the edited version that's on today's agenda and reflect word for word the legally submitted proclamation for July as independence month submitted by Clark County citizens Kimberly Goheen Elvin and Carmen De Leon. We ask that a photograph be taken with Kimberly and Carmen next to the American flag with no need of council members involved. This council has shown, in my opinion, absolutely no respect for the independence month as those freedom and liberties under God in our republic stand. You edited our, uh, you edited out the name, the Lord's name. You edited out graves, guns, bells, bonfires, and illumination. They edited out uh, our guarantee of our right ballot any government or all of them if they become destructive and institute the government of what is going on here. We edited out the fireworks taken by the Vancouver City Council that they, they took away our fireworks and they were the largest celebration of heritage this side of the Mississippi. Okay, okay thank you. Your time is up. Oh, thank you for that. Ma'am, if you could please step back. And for uh, future speakers, we have ordered a new audio system, but don't yell into the mic and keep your, you know, keep some distance between the microphone and just talk in normal terms. We can control uh, the volume, but we do have some different audio equipment coming at some point. Within the next couple of months. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, please state your name and I try to remember. your comment. Is it on now? Did he push it again? Hello? Hello? Yeah? Yeah, it's on? Okay. Well, I was pretty surprised that he spent a bunch of time talking to them because he's never done that for us. We've talked here plenty of times, and you never take any time to talk to us. And, you know, I know I'm supposed to talk on the minutes, and, um, yeah, we did submit this proclamation, and it has been pretty much, uh, it's not even close to what we started out with. It's kind of a joke. Um, we asked for Independence Month. Um, because, you know, you have TriMet month. Not everybody writes TriMet, but they get a month. Everybody's independent, but we don't get an independence month. We got a, a pride month, but we don't get an independence month, you know? It's kind of insulting, um, and I do believe that it's 100% because of my ethics complaint on you, because I was insulted three, four times, but that's why I sat there and said, practice what you preach, because I was insulted first. I was called belligerent. I was called bashing. I followed my complaint. Ma'am, no one's ever yeah. insulted you, and you're no, off no, topic. Don't interrupt if you could me again. Stick, don't interrupt stick to me the subject dude. you would Keep like to speak with, turn. otherwise you're talking turn. about personal and people and about, about things that, that don't exist. We, we did something, and you guys have removed our names. My name isn't on the proclamation anymore. And what are you guys going to do? Take a picture with yourselves like you invented this? It came from us. We submitted it. You've done what you wanted. I bet you're going to vote it out now just for spite because it came from us, U.S. citizens. But if we were gay, that'd be fine. If we rode the bus, that'd be fine. If we, hey, you're talking about lifestyles you know, now that's no, prohibited. I'm just saying that you conduct, did a proclamation for that. You it's did a proclamation for Please poetry. stick to your own topic. For poetry, there's a proclamation. For transit, there's a proclamation, but not independence. Oh, terrible independence for these people. How dare us think that we have freedom of speech? Because the man's right there ready to arrest me if I say the wrong thing again. 
You know, it's too bad you feel so intimidated that you have to overpower everything. You're not a judge in here. You are just in charge of listening to public's ideas. Okay, uh, once that again, you're getting off topic, ma'am. You're once talking again, about you're particular interrupting people like a five -year -old, on staff and, and elected. That's why you have two ethics investigations going on. Almost always two ethics investigation going on. You need a third. Exceeding the bounds because of appropriate conduct. you don't respect people's conduct. time and you still like you to talk like a five-year-old on top of people. How old are you? How old are you? This isn't a courtroom. It's a public arena, and the Constitution states that we are your bosses. Are you guys going to call the police on me now and have me arrested and drag me away? Because obviously you don't want me on TV. You guys don't put us on TV. Yeah. You guys put anybody else? Like, am I too ugly? Huh? What's, what's up? You think it's a joke? That concludes your statement. Thank you. Well, Next speaker, please. Me. Please say your name for the record. Did it work? Okay, my name is Linda Marusik. I'm uh, previously employed by the City of Vancouver City Attorney's Office. I'm here to speak in support of the county's work with the city on the mental health sales tax and funding the bridge shelter. Um, after I retired from the city, I worked to work for St. Paul Lutheran Church. We run the only um, in-house shelter downtown and um, we're full all the time. The 415 main that the city approved is also full. Um, there's clearly a need and the council is um, uh, able to help with the immediacy of the real estate transaction and I would just encourage you to do so. Appreciate your listening. Thank you. Additional comments from in the room? How about online? Do we have anyone online? Okay. I'm sorry, you do? Okay, please go ahead. Caller, please state your name and go ahead with your comments. Yeah, my name is Rob Anderson, and I'm speaking about the initiative uh, that is on the agenda, the initiative uh, charter amendment. Uh, I just was really aware that this was back on the agenda. It was, I was told that it was postponed, and then um, I see that uh, it was a little vague, and I was just made aware about an hour ago. So. Public, you're not going to get a lot of public comment. I was organizing quite a bit of public comment, but called it off because I was told it was uh, postponed. But anyways, I want the council to uh, realize that if this initiative goes through, there is no doubt that it will further restrict the initiative process. And the Washington State Constitution is very clear saying that the right of petition shall not be abridged yet Clark County already has one of the most restrictive initiative processes already when you compare it to the other seven home rule charters. Mr. Kimsey presented to you some straw man uh, argument uh, in his original pr proposal of this, that for example, if Skamani County wanted to gobble up Clark County and make it no more, uh, our current initiative couldn't stop it. That's not true. There's a provision saying that you can't um, stop an already program of, of the county. The second thing that he brought forward was the budget issue. But what he failed to inform the council is, is that a part of the initiative process is, is that there would be a hearing before the Clark County Council, staff report would be able to assess it and information would be known regarding the budget impact before it went onto uh, the ballot. So these two arguments that he puts forward is really not valid enough to have a third, a third charter amendment added to, to revise this. And in the last nine years, almost 10 years, uh, there's been no successful initiatives and it's because of the restrictive nature. So if the council wants only state sanctioned initiatives, then they should go forward with this. I'm asking you not to, that these constitutional rights 
of initiative are valuable and should be protected. Thank you. Thank you. Any other online? No. No. Okay. Last call for in the room. Otherwise, we'll go to old business 4.1 minutes. Any motions? I move approval of the minutes. Thank you. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries 4.2, the Independence Day Proclamation. Good afternoon, Council. For the record, uh, Jordan Bogey, Senior Policy Analyst. Uh, so this is following up on our discussion last week uh, about this proclamation, uh, and I edited it. Uh, in uh, line with Council's uh, direction to move from Independence Month to an Independence Day uh, proclamation. And so I would present this to you uh, for your consideration. And um, if you're supportive, then um, would look for a, a thumbs up or down uh, or, or any potential edits. Council, comments, questions? Please. Uh, you're, you're out of order, ma'am. No one's at calling on you. You're disrupting the meeting. Okay, well, um, do we have, Chair, just, just go one, ahead, go on. One quick comment that I would like to make is there is nothing illegal that has been done here. Initiatives are at the purview of the council. They can be suggested by members of the public and it is subject to council approval. Council can change anything that's submitted. We have complete control over this situation and, and we're doing our best to be accommodating to individuals that have requested to have those pro or, uh, proclamations made. And I think that this is a, a good compromise and in good faith to work with the individuals from the community that have put this information forward and request this, request this proclamation. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Are we still supportive? And I see thumbs up. I see Karen. Okay, unanimous as is. Thank you, Jordan, for the work you've done. Thank you, Council. Did we get our picture? Ma'am, you're out of order. I'm going to ask you to leave if you can't stop interrupting the meeting. 4.3, proposed charter amendment, section 7.2 initiative. Who is going to present that? I believe it will be the PA's office and or Greg Kimsey. Good afternoon, counselors. Uh, Greg Kimsey here. I am available to speak on this if you'd like, or um, if uh, the process attorney's office is going to speak, that's, uh, I'm, I'm available to speak if you'd like. Okay, and that was the mystery voice was Greg Kimsey, our auditor. Thank you. And, and this is Leslie Lopez. I'll just say, um, I'll go ahead and let you, I guess, present. Um, these, it's my understanding and, and working with um, Mr. Kimsey that these changes I made, the only thing I was going to recommend um, is removing one of the provisions only because it is repeated in another section. So if you could scroll down. Um, I mean, we can put it in the ordinance form, that's fine. Sorry, if you could go back up to the, the bottom of the next page. Right there is fine, great, thank you. So under um, section B1 for the initiative procedures, it states in red within 15 business days of the filing date, Prosecuting attorney shall determine if the initiative includes a subject um, that may not be proposed or adopted by initiative as described in section 7.2A. One, my suggestion is that sentence be removed because that provision is actually further down already stated in the current charter. Um, if you scroll down, I can show you where that is. Uh, you can stop there. Um, I know you, we have a long way to go, but can I just 
throw out some questions because if we weren't a charter and we were just relying on state law, is this 15-day review by the PA's office the normal practice in each county if initiative is brought? My understanding in reviewing the other charter counties that there aren't other prosecuting attorney's offices that provide an opinion on an initiative. Okay, and that, so the next question was focusing on charter counties. Is it the same answer? I'm sorry, I was talking about charter counties. We're talking about It's that. only charter counties that are able to do this. Because otherwise, if they're a regular county, they would follow the state, the RCW, and so that that was my first question. So, so what does the RCW if, say? If if I might, Councillor, uh, please go you. ahead. Great. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that it's only charter counties that have the ability to have local initiatives. Uh, statutory code counties do not have the power of initiatives. Isn't that correct? Uh, Ms. Lopez? That is correct. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Because, you know, we just heard a speaker say that we're going to have, if this passes, if the people adopt it, we'll have the most restrictive process for initiatives. And I'm just wondering, would that be true? Um, and just focusing on charter counties at this point. Sure, um, and I just want to make clear that the change I'm requesting is only because that language is already in the current charter. So I'm not asking to change the current charter. I'm just asking that that particular section, just so it's not repeated. That's that's the that's a clarification. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions before we continue on? You were just about to point out, uh, Leslie, where that duplication is. Where is it? Thank you. So that's it. on this particular page. It's um, paragraph number two, about the middle of the paragraph. It states that um, after the auditor confers with the petitioner to review and establish the form and style of the petition, within an additional 10 days, that is when the prosecuting attorney shall evaluate and provide the statement um, of its opinion regarding whether or not it's within the scope of local initiative powers. Okay, I think we're ready to continue. Yeah, good afternoon, Council. Uh, Larry Stafford, Audit Services Manager with Clark County Auditor's Office. Uh, mainly here to support Greg, because uh, he's remote in case there's technical difficulties. So I'll uh, turn it over to Greg for his comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Larry. Uh, Councilor Medvedi, would you like me to speak on this uh, proposed charter amendment? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so first, I would um, offer up that this amendment does nothing, nothing to restrict the ability of citizens to make law through the initiative process. Uh, this amendment, if enacted by voters, would increase transparency and reduce complexity. Um, there are three, uh, and, and first, uh, I would like to apologize for not being there in person. I am at the uh, statewide elections conference where our elections director, Kathy Garber, is being recognized as the election administrator of the year by Secretary of State Steve Hobbs. Um, very proud of, of Kathy and the entire team there, and um, just made a decision that it was uh, really important that I be here to uh, speak about her achievements and her recognition. So again, apologize for not being there. Um, the three sections I'd like to really highlight to your attention is the uh, uh, the provision that when there is a financial impact of an initiative to the county, that um, uh, that would be an estimate of that would be provided by the budget office. C citizen lawmakers would lawmakers, whether they're citizens or elected officials, benefit from knowing the cost of the laws they propose. Uh, this proposed charter amendment would provide the budget office six weeks to determine if a proposed initiative would result in increased expenditures, and if it would increase those expenditures, prepare an estimate of those expenditures. If the proposed initiative results in increased expenses, 
the <laughs> estimate of that cost would appear on the petition so that people who are uh, choosing to sign the petition or considering signing the petition would be aware of the cost of that. This is uh, precisely the, uh, what occurs in Olympia with state legislators where they are uh, proposing legislation, they get a financial impact statement. Um, secondly, the change from the current charter would uh, require that the prosecutor's opinion regarding whether or not the initiative is within the scope, outside the scope, or that they have no opinion about whether the initiative is within the scope or not, that that's, that opinion or lack thereof would appear on the petition as well so that uh, citizen lawmakers who are considering signing the petition would also have that information. And then the third element um, gets a little bit technical, but it, uh, it, uh, clears, it, clear, it reduces the complexity in calculating the number of required signatures uh, when the when the petition when the initial petition uh, subject is only regarding an unincorporated area, uh, it would make that calculation of the signatures required for people in the uh, voters in uh, in the unincorporated area. The same process we use when the petition is affecting the entire county. So with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions or uh, address any concerns. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I'd like to ask Emily Zwetzik a question. Please. And Go ahead, that Karen. is um, that first uh, change that was made regarding the uh, budget office calculations that would be done. Is that something that is reasonable as far as expectations on your office? Thank you, uh, Council. I I, I'm not sure. It's hard to answer because it's unknown what the volume of requests would be or the complexity of those requests would be. So I have just stated my concern about um, the existing resources I have available within the budget office and the current level of work that we perform. Um, adding this on uh, may be reasonable if it's if it's one or two and they're very simple requests, but but there's no flexibility in the language that allows for scalability or complexity or volume of requests. And that's where my concern lies. <clears throat> and so I think ahead, uh, I've asked this ahead, before. Karen. I'm I wondering asked, if you have language that might be helpful to consider. Uh, I would ask to work with um, legal. Like I, I think we requested this last time when we looked at it, when the council looked at it in March. <clears throat> that I wanted to try to think about some flexibility in the language. I don't know if that's possible um, or if that would be recommended from the PA's office, but I would I would look to them to help me articulate that better if, if that's something the council wants to do. <clears throat> Chair. Does that conclude your questions, Karen? It does. I, I have concern with uh, codifying this if in fact uh, there would be many uh, initiatives proposed in a single uh, swipe and making it uh, super difficult for the office to uh, come forward with accurate estimates. So I, I, I have concerns about that. I don't know how much time we have now to make changes. Um, what is the situation there? <clears throat> So we do have um, a public hearing already noticed for June 25th. Um, I think that notice went out yesterday. Um, we can certainly make some tweaks. Um, I would probably recommend this week make some tweaks or today give some that guidance so we can get it updated online so that people have enough time to review it. Um, and then we can also continue that hearing uh, to a date certain as well. Okay. Thank you. I, I think if maybe we should consider doing that, Chair, and um, figuring out um, language that would give a little bit of leeway without without uh, too much, because we don't want there to be uh, a situation that is taken advantage of. It would just be when we need accurate estimates from the budget office, and and we need to give time to do that. So before we go to Glenn, if you just bear with me, because I, it's an important, important point, and sometimes there's a for and against. 
And the for and against may completely interpret the financial costs differently. That could be part of the process. It could be controversial as to how much it would really cost. So I, we do need that in, input to make sure it's at least feasible at a minimum that we're able to uh, make kind of some kind of informed estimate because voters are entitled to know what will this cost if this initiative passes. I think uniformly every county, government, city government, nobody likes unfunded mandates. So the public may think, hey, this is a great idea. Without any knowledge of how much it will cost, vote on it, and then the county has no way to actually fund the position or the, the initiative. So anyway, there's, I think we're going to have to sort through this. I'm still firmly uh, believe this is an important data point, either for or against uh, any initiative, and we, we need to take some kind of step forward uh, to quantify what the costs will be. Glenn? Yes, uh, Emily, I was just trying to understand the nature of, of your concern and um, see if, if if it's your intention to complete that task quicker than that time period and that you just need it in case it's a much more complex you know, situation or if there's multiple initiatives that come in at the same time. Thank you for the question. I apologize, I have allergies, so my voice is coming and going. Uh, um, I will try to <clears throat> keep it from crackling. Um, I have concerns because right now the budget office with our current staffing levels is, is, is at capacity with our current workloads. So any layering on top of that for a comprehensive financial analysis and costing based on the initiative uh, would be in addition to that. So we would have to try to fit that in within our existing obligations and um, regular uh, tasks that we have going every year. Uh, we would complete it as quickly as possible. Uh, there would be uh, no intent to delay on that, but my ability to task my staff to address these um, calculations and estimated impacts would require time. It could possibly require um, coordinating with other departments and offices or other outside agencies to get information depending on what the initiative. I think that's that's my concern is we we don't know. We don't know what is going to be requested and we don't know the complexity of that. And I think um, flexibility in the language could be a possible um, solution for this point in time, but I also would ask the council to consider if this is something that is, is wanting to be moved forward with, I mean, are there additional resources that the council would be willing to consider so that we have um, staffing available to address these as, as they're presented? Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And then I guess my next question would be for, for Larry. Do you see any hurdles or any problems in the process that that would create to have a little longer window? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'll certainly defer to Greg if he's still on the line about this being an expert, but I think there are, there are specific timelines laid out in the initiative process and the charter that could be affected because there are certain number of days before the uh, election that the signatures have to be turned in. And so there's some fixed points. So uh, by extending that, you may affect how early those uh, petitions have to be filed. But I don't discount the, the need to know the cost of this change before it's enacted, very similar in the conversation, actually. I don't know if Greg has any thoughts on that. Well, I, Councilor Young, I'm not sure if your question related to the uh, language and impact in the charter and the filing of, of initiatives or your question related to um, the deadlines on when uh, the council would have to take action in order to get a uh, proposed charter amendment on this year's general election ballot. Uh, the deadline to get an, a question on the November 2024 ballot is August 6th to the elections office. But also just to add to that, we have to do pro and con state or statements. So we have to do press release to that. You have a public hearing. So if this was not going to be updated by the end of this week, we're going to have to extend this this particular public hearing and we're going to, have to do a special meeting um, to meet our deadlines to get everything to the auditor's office. So 
Yes, thank you. Um, I think on the one hand, uh, we want to make this as accessible as possible to the public. I would not want to see if timelines get shifted, any reduction in the amount of time people have to gather signatures. And then also we want the public to have as much information as possible when they're voting. Uh, so I think it's too bad this issue didn't come before us a little bit earlier in the process because I think it's a significant one. And I know um, having worked for a state legislature and dealing with fiscal impacts, uh, often uh, a bill would just, there would be a determination likely to have a fiscal impact or no fiscal impact. So there could be a preliminary uh, decision without doing a full-blown uh, fiscal impact statement. Um, so I think that could be a possibility. There could be some preliminary information without doing a full-blown uh, analysis, because I agree that it could take a good chunk of time to do that, to do that accurately, and it's you know, we have no idea how many uh, initiatives may be coming forward at any any one time. So those are some of my thoughts. And then looking at what is prohibited uh, from bringing forward as an initiative, item three here, uh, it's prohibited to bring forward something that is authorizing or repealing an appropriation of money or any portion of the annual budget. So if there is a huge fiscal impact, it might be that it's not really eligible to be in the initiative process from the get-go. So it seems like there's some threshold there even to be eligible to be on the ballot. So um, um, I if, understand if I'm, if I, oh, Sure, yeah, go ahead. If, if I might, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Councillor Marshall. Um, those limitations on initiatives that are listed in section 7.2a um, are simply informational to, um, to the public. Um, an initiative that did propose a uh, fee or tax or something uh, would not be prohibited from being placed in the ballot with sufficient number of signatures. And perhaps uh, Ms. Lopez would like to uh, expand on that. Also, uh, I guess while I'm, while I'm speaking, I guess I would also make the point that uh, since the county charter has been put into place, which did create the powers of lawmaking through the initiative process by citizens, um, I believe I'm correct in saying there has been a single initiative, uh, one initiative that would have, uh, in my opinion, uh, the budget office would have determined there was a financial impact. Um, so I think that perhaps that offers up a point of perspective. So, you know, I alluded to this earlier. When you have um, organized effort, there's a for and against. They're often opposed the financial impact. And they came up with their own analysis that was then presented to the public. So that's kind of a natural part of the process, perhaps. And I'm, I'm just, I, I don't want to exceed the capacity of our financial team in any one of these. So Greg, how do they solve it in other states? How do they do it as far as because I know other states do require financial impact information to come forward with initiatives. Uh, do they put the burden on the person uh, promoting the initiative? Uh, do they just leave it to the state offices or local government entities to do the calculations? How do others get this information before the voters? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, so in your uh, in your in your comments there, uh, you're you're really speaking on the, kind of the for and against. That's that's more in effect what happens after a question is placed on the ballot. What what this would result in is something that was done uh, well in advance of that. This is done when the initiative is first filed, um, and the uh, uh, this is again you know um, as you as you spoke to there this model. Uh, occurs in many legislative arenas, and in fact, um, it, it's not at all dissimilar from what happens in Clark County when a counselor might have an idea for an ordinance or a law and asks the uh, budget office for an estimate 
of what that uh, cost might be, the, the financial impact of that or ordinance uh, might be. Um, I'd, I'd also point out that the county, uh, the budget office has access to uh, resources beyond uh, that specific office. There are uh, financial analysts throughout the county that could be brought to bear in the um, uh, as I, in the event that an issue is presented that has a that has been determined to have a financial impact, and I would, uh, uh, I guess, once again point out that, uh, in my opinion, there's been one initiative in ten years where that uh, would have had a financial impact. But there are there are lots of smart people in the county with the ability to conduct financial analysis of uh, proposals. Are they so, I want to reach to, to, Yes. Yes, yeah, they people, are county employees. Yeah, um, Mr. Stafford sitting in front of you is someone who's very uh, capable of conducting that type of analysis. For the, uh, the initiative that just recently failed, um, the uh, uh, information technologies uh, IT office provided an estimate of the cost of that um, that initiative. Um, there are people in the uh, the finance team. There's budget office. There's the treasurer's office. Uh, there's there are yeah, so I, uh, great. And Emily, is that what you meant when you said consider going beyond the budget office? Yes, I mean, I, I do envision um, requests like this could be very similar <clears throat> to other types of financial projects and uh, financial requests we get either from the council or things that the finance team might vet or things that we would work with mm -hmm. a specific department or agency on. Um, it's the coordination and the review and the um, kind of the validation of that data, bringing that back to present for um, this purpose that I think would require additional time. Um, this is also um, assuming that, let's say, for example, I needed to work with the sheriff's office on initiative. It's assuming that their staff and their time would be available um, you know, in this time frame to respond to, to things. It's assuming that that would all come together within that 30 day time frame. Um, and I just, I do have concerns about that only because it's unknown the volume and it's unknown the complexity of those requests that might come through. Um, if I could, I'm sorry, I could one more question off. for me. Um, can, would that can we be, all uh, would that be Go ahead, something Karen. that if, Emily, if Emily's office, the budget office were to reach out that that needs to have uh, language adjustment in what is you have presented here, or is that a given that her that her office can reach out to incorporate others' work with with the budget office? It would be at the it would be at the discretion of the county budget office as to where information they relied on to form their opinion. So, and and there's no restriction of doing that in this document before us, correct? Not that I see. Okay, thank you. So I want to point to what Sue Marshall just said and, and then the discussion that Greg just entered in on the timing, because there will be disputes as to what financial impact would be, depending on which side you're sitting on. If Greg, what do we lose if we leave that detail for the ballot fight later on in the process, the pros and cons, just leave that up to those that are for it and those that are against it, but just require pretty much what Sue said her experience was in the legislature. Let's just have a preliminary up front. This will have a financial impact. You know, just a cursory yes or no kind of swag at it so that we know it's an issue and then we'll leave it up to the rest of the initiative process to find to sort through that. What what do you think of that? So so Gary, are you are you suggesting that this swag would be a statement that simply says this will have financial impact, or you're are you suggesting that the swag would have some kind of ballpark number associated with that swag? I would suggest whatever our financial office thinks is within their capability. Okay, um, I guess I would. I would go back to the thinking about this in terms of 
lawmakers. Um, as a member of the Clark County Council, if you were being presented a proposed ordinance from one of your fellow council members, um, I think your one of your first questions would be, how much will this cost? Um, if you are a member of the state legislature and are looking at a proposed bill, one of your first questions will be, how much is how much will this cost? Um, when it gets to the voters, uh, so that you know the second step of this, it, a successful initiative would be placed on a ballot. Um, I also think it would be very um, uh, helpful for voters to have that same estimate of financial impact available to voters. Because in the initiative process, there are you know, two steps of lawmakers. There's the people who are initiating the proposal, and then there are the, the voters who are the final lawmakers. I think for at both steps, uh, it's the people, well, pe three steps really, proposal initiative, people sign the petition, and then the voters. Uh, very helpful for the people who are signing the petition, who are putting, making effort to place this question on the ballot, helpful for those voters to have an estimate, and we emphasize an estimate of the financial impact. Um, I uh, um, sympathize or empathize with uh, the budget office's uh, concerns about resources. Again, I'd point out this has happened, there's been one initiative in 10 years. Um, I would hope that if a counselor uh, would go to the budget office with a, uh, a, an idea, a proposed ordinance, and ask the budget office to prepare an estimate of the cost of that. They could do that in less than um, six weeks, 30 business days. Um, if it took more than 30 business days, I uh, would hope that the budget office would um, have enough confidence in other resources that they could find through the county to assist them in preparing that estimate. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? This, if I can. Yes, this, please. And this may not be appropriate, um, but I'm, Emily's got what, five staff in the budget office. They're very small for a $500 million budget responsibility. And I would say all of our financial resources are busy. They all have jobs. Um, is there any thought of putting in here that there would be a financial impact and add a dollar amount so that we can maybe contract out to do the financial analysis. So this could be the first one to say there's, there's gonna be a budget impact to ensure that we can meet a deadline. And I understand it may not be helpful, but I know, because I work with Emily a lot, they do a lot for five people, for 1,700 employees and a 500 and some, or actually 700. It's a lot, that's a lot for five people. And, and I do know the finance team will step up. I know Larry would step up and other financial, but at what cost is that? That's also a cost because we're now having to pull resources to do it. So just food for thought. I, I guess as I'm thinking about it right now, um, I, th I think I would be supportive of just a cursory, may have a fiscal impact, leave it to the pro and con arguments to make their best case. It'll be more information that the voters are receiving. I think there's uncertainty about the impact uh, to the county to develop these uh, uh, financial impact statements. Uh, and I think they would be a point themselves of challenge, uh, depending on, uh, well, they would probably always be a point of challenge. So I see that as a solution too, but there's only four of us here today and we will ultimately need four uh, to agree. Yeah, uh, but you could um, provide some direction with the majority today for any updates to this before the hearing. True. Glenn, and I'm sorry, yeah. Chair, I just, I can't go with that. As a member of the public, I, I would be really puzzled by how to vote if I got no information to speak of, except there will be an impact, until the ballots came out. And then I got, or until the voters pamphlet, I guess, came out. What a confusing mess if you had two divergent opinions that weren't based on expertise of our county employees. I, I just can't go with that. 
So I I would go with a um, uh, ability for the budget office to pull in others into the the writing of a statement, and it you know there are levels and degrees that it can go forward with, but still it can give some specificity to the voters so they understand what they are voting for or against. If if I if I might uh, interrupt. Uh, uh... Council, um, if if you would like to substitute the auditor's office word instead of the budget office to prepare this estimate, that's fine by me. That would be fine by me. The auditor's office be would be quite willing to take on this responsibility. Well, we we must be giving you too much of a budget to be ha having that. <laughs> Flexibility, uh, Glenn. You were going to say something. Yes, I was going to come. I have a separate matter to discuss too, but we'll finish ironing this out here. But um, I, my my thoughts are similar to Councillor Bowerman in that I think that it really is valuable for the voter to understand the the real impact because may impact or does impact. Does it, I mean it could be five dollars. It could be five million. You know, so I, I do think it's worth the the effort. Now I'm definitely open to um, Greg's suggestion. Would like to understand from staff if that would be a possible way to go, if that would be responsible. And then I also would would kind of to throw into the mix, and I don't know if it would be possible, but um, if for purposes of the initiative it, or the signature forms requiring it will have a budget impact, but not requiring the full scale of that impact until you put it on the ballot. And I mean, that kind of brings up my next subject, which is we want to make sure that's on the voters pamphlet, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so let's stay on track though. Greg, like any other um, elected official with his own department, I mean, we get people going to our budget office asking for help. If, you, if you're willing uh, to take that on, I, I would be the third vote, I think, in moving it forward with keeping it as it is, but replacing the auditor as a responsible party. And then we can get into the detail that Glenn just brought up in a moment. How did, so, um, Greg, if you, I mean, had you thought about that or did you just come up with that solution just now? No, I mean, the, the thought crossed my head, you know, when I was first drafting this proposed amendment. Um, but it is, it is the budget office that is looking prospectively into the future. Um, it's the auditor's office that looks at where things are right now and uh, in the past. However, the auditor's office does have um, uh, several um, very talented, uh, highly skilled uh, financial analysts. Um, and I, I know you're, I think you were kidding when you said, you know, we have too generous a budget. But in response to that, what I would say is, it's a question of prioritization. And when voters are, when, when someone is proposing an ordinance, uh, proposing a law, that is, in my view, should be a very high priority. And the auditor's office would reallocate existing resources to, to address the high priorities that comes right there. So, yeah, I'm absolutely willing to scratch out budget office and put auditor's office there. Actually, just scratch out budget and put auditors. That's perfectly fine. So, Karen, are you okay with that? You bet. I'm on. So, I, I just had another thought based on what Councillor Young said in terms of when the actual uh, financial statement gets done. And if there is a may have a fiscal impact uh, during the signature gathering, I think that would be helpful. And then the full impact statement done, if it makes it to the ballot, that seems like a reasonable timing. So. Yeah. If, if I think I it's might. good to include the timing into that. And then further, I, I think there's value in both having the budget office and the auditor if there could be collaboration from 
the two of them because of the budget office in terms of uh, uh, forecasting forward, there's value in including that information. So I think depending on the timing, uh, it's a big hurdle to get all those signatures. Uh, that would winnow down the potential, although we've only had one in the last 10 years. It's sounding like there's not going to be a rush to get a bunch of initiatives on the ballot. Uh, and, and I agree the information is important to the voters. So I'm hearing a way forward on this. So, and Karen, to your point about educating the public, you know, it will be a process. And if the auditor ensures that they've answered the mail on the best fiscal impact, that'll be fleshed out through the pro and con process and gathering signatures. Um, so I'm hearing some general consensus. And I, Karen, you just showed us a thumbs up. I'm gonna give a yes, thumbs yes, up. Yes, I did. Sus and Sue. What is that thumbs up to, exactly? So I, I, I would like to check with the budget office just to make sure that the shift to the auditor's office will functionally work for them and that, that it, I'm, I'm happy to go that route. I think it's a great solution, but I want to double check just to make sure. So the thumbs up was to having basically this original amendment, but adding in the auditor's responsibility for providing that cost impact. I would not want to exclude the budget office no, from not, that not process. Really. No. I think any any elected official would. I mean, we're everyone goes to our five person team on any financial question. So, I mean, Emily, you're not going to resist. No, no, and I think, you. I think that, and I appreciate the auditor's offer to spearhead this because of the available resources. It sounds like they have to reallocate for this. We in the budget office do not have that flexibility with just our current mandatory requirements, and we would we would definitely partner with them and help to um, provide these financial analysis and um, help them with what's needed and and have these conversations in the future. Super. So I think we have all four of us now. We're missing Michelle today to move forward towards. Um, the, was it the 25th is the hearing? Yes, uh, June 25th. Sure. Well, Please, just one, one more before we move forward. Um, I, I was given a thumbs up to make that particular change. I would like to suggest, because from my understanding in the the text of the amendment, there is nothing that specifies, spec can't use my words this morning, that specifically states that the financial impact be in the voters pamphlet. And so I think we should add that language to the amendment to ensure that it does get put in there. And I have text prepared for um, an amendment to the suggestion if council. If, uh, if, 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 if I might. Greg? Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor Young, thank you for that um, uh, proposed amendment. I uh, found it really interesting that yesterday's Columbia Natura Board was so supportive of placing the financial impact of initiatives on on the ballot that was supported by the judge's decision in Thurston County. And but um Councillor Young, you, you mentioned placing that financial impact information on in the voters pamphlet. Uh what what the what the state law uh says and what the judge reaffirmed yesterday was placing that financial impact information on the ballot and which would of course would be in the voters pamphlet as well. But I wanted to clarify that uh, are you are you suggesting that the amendment would be that the financial impact state estimate estimated financial impact uh, statement would be on the ballot? Is that what you're suggesting uh, or proposing, Councillor Young? Uh, yes, yes, that is correct on the ballot. Thank, thank you. And so, what you meant on the voters pamphlet, uh, Councillor Young? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I said that by error. My apologies. So you meant on the ballot? Correct. Oh, okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. I'm supportive. Greg, any objection? Uh, no, no, I think it's a fabulous Input. idea. I, I think it's a fabulous idea. Okay. Uh, you know, the more information you get the voters, uh, the more informed decisions voters can make, the better the whole system works. So thank you, Councilor Young, for bringing that forward. 
And Sue's indicating uh, affirmative support, Karen? Yes. All right, there you have it. Leslie? Sorry, I'm taking notes here. Just wanna make sure confirming what the thumbs up are for. Um, so it sounds like, let me just look at the language here. So on the page we're looking at now, where it says, and the Clark County Budget Office shall determine if the petition would result in increased expenditures, or that's going to be changed to the auditor's office. Is that correct? Is that yeah, so uh, just reviewing the proposed changes, the, the term budget office appears six times okay. in here. So I, I appreciate the question to clarify which components of those are going to change. So I think the, the thumbs up was specifically to preparing the financial impact statement and I think there was still some interest possibly in the budget office being involved early in determining that there is an increased expense. Um, so that could maybe force or engender some of that collaboration, which already happens, but maybe formalizing that. Great, and just to confirm also that it's also to include the, um, es the estimate of the actual cost on the petition. Is that what the thumbs up is for? as well as on the ballot, right? I, I thought that on the petition, it would be there may be a fiscal impact, but only when it achieved the number of signatures would the fiscal impact be done. That's what I understood Councilor Young's suggestion was. That was something that I had suggested, but that was to try to stretch out the time that the budget office would have. If the auditor's office can be compliant in the shorter time period, I'm all for just putting it on bold. I think you said, I think you said ballot again and meant pamphlet, voters pamphlet. I mean, we're not yeah, putting on the, ballot. the actual voting yep. ballot. But and and then no. just to clarify, no. a, f a full blown financial impact statement would be a lot more lengthy. So it would have to be just cursory information about estimated annual cost, uh, ongoing costs, something, something brief. Councillor Marshall, the, okay. the, state, the statement is uh, very brief. It's contained in the charter amendment there. Um, you can you can see it right there, and I I do believe that the what Councillor Benvenge asked for and received was four votes for the proposed amendment as presented to you today, with the deletion of the word budget and the insertion of the word auditors. And then Councillor Young, Councilor Young's uh, amendment, which again, I believe received four votes, was to require that estimated financial impact on the ballot as well as on the petition. Yeah, and, and Greg, if I might just uh, add on a point directly to what's on screen here for folks in the room. Um, item number one, you would mentioned in referring to Councillor Marshall, the, the specific statement is actually there in quotes near the end of that the Clark County Budget Office estimates the cost, that term budget would need to change, estimates the cost to implement this initiative would be dollars and the annual operating cost would be dollars quote. So that would be the statement on the ballot, the summarized version they referred to. And just prior to that, um, the term budget office appears twice in that paragraph. Um, I believe that's well, what I had heard is the first one would remain the budget office. If the budget office determines an increased expenditures will occur. The second one, if the Clark County auditors, uh, no, if Clark County budget office determines the petition would result in increased expenditures within 30 business days of filing date, it would be replaced with the auditor's office instead of the budget office. The auditor's office shall provide the petitioner and then you can get rid of an auditor with the following financial impact statement. So the budget office would be determining there is an increased expenses and then the, the auditor's office would be preparing the impact statement. It, it, did that accurately correct uh, or correctly capture what you intended, uh, Greg and counselors? Well, yeah, not me as the counselors. Is that what the counselors intended? Yes. Uh, yes. I think we're, we're beating this to death at this point, but I think we're on the same page. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much to all of you. Are we are we ready to move on to new business? 
I think we are. Okay, so we'll move on to new business item number five. There's none today. My pen just died. Okay, so um, Councilor reports. No Councilor reports? Just quickly, Monday we kind of kicked off the new season for the Urban County Policy Board. So we had a quarterly report with an update on how our projects are doing, whether they're timely or not. And uh, we made had some great suggestions on how to move forward and trying to keep our proposals and our grants timely so we don't get ourselves in a situation where we don't receive those funding any, the funding anymore. But just want to let everybody know we had that committee meeting. I just thought of something. Uh, last week I attended the uh, opening of Cozy Camp, a uh, five acre neighborhood park, just a couple blocks south of 179th on 29th. Uh, and so it's an amenity that that community very much needs. Uh, folks just walked there from the neighborhood. Uh, it was uh, much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen, do you have any reports? No, not today. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, and Michelle's not here. Just, I guess, an update on CTRAN. They were grateful for our proclamations. Um, and also, they did give an update on the status of uh, the driver situation. Uh, they do have a big class coming forward. Uh, they are ch make, making changes to the required work schedules of the drivers to alleviate basically the four six days a week driving. Uh, they're trying to take prudent steps uh, to correct uh, the, the burden, um, the overburden on their drivers right now. So there is a way ahead. It's still going to be in process for another couple months, um, but they're working hard on alleviating the uh, the driver shortage, which is directly attributed to um, the training pipeline not being uh, big enough, but they're addressing that as well. So CRC, uh, CTRAN is on track to uh, getting through this situation. All right, we'll go to seven. You know, I'm sorry, Chair. Yeah. You mentioning CTRAN reminded me of RTC, and there is one other okay, thing I think would be of great interest to the uh, council and community. And that is that a Republic, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that, a Senator from uh, the 19th legislative district uh, named uh, Senator Wilson is going to propose a uh, bridge disaster uh, program legislation that is almost identical to our resolution. I'm just thrilled. And uh, so that is something that uh, we may want to uh, follow. I've talked with uh, Jordan about it in the upcoming session um, because it would be nice to get, obviously, the momentum behind that for uh, greater eyes on the topic. Okay, thank you for that, Karen. Uh, so we have a work session request on legacy lands, farmland conservation, something I've been earnestly waiting for. Um, so at the end of last year, uh, council did provide direction to staff to develop a framework for farmland conservation program and legacy lands. So they are looking for a one hour request, be looking for council guidance on conservation priorities, areas in the county where you want to see and emphasize conservation, funding amounts and desired outcomes. And Councilor Marshall? Yes, I uh, will need to recuse myself from this decision because I may be seeking a farm conservation easement. Okay, thank you for that. So the rest of us, are we still looking forward to having this work session? Yes. Okay, super, thank you. And good luck on your efforts. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so uh, policy updates. Good afternoon, counselors. Uh, again, for the record, Jordan Bogey. Uh, I've got three items for you today. Um, 
And so the first one is related to uh, another charter amendment, um, and this is in relation to the uh, county clerk. And so I know this has just come forward recently, and so I'm going to turn it over to Kathleen to talk a little bit more about this specifically. Okay, so we are um, in some discussions with uh, our law and justice partners in the clerk and superior court, and we are having just some discussions on, and also the jail, on that part of process. Um, I know it's been uh, brought up historically just a little bit, and so as we're coming up with a timeline and a deadline to get things on the November ballot, I just wanted to ask counsel for your initial, is that something that you would want to consider for this ballot, uh, for the November ballot, to make that position non-elected? If so, then um, we can draft the documents, probably gonna have to schedule a couple special meetings uh, to make sure we're meeting the deadline. Um, if not, uh, we certainly don't have to move forward. So this is just for that initial, like, yes, we're interested and want further discussion or no. So I would just say, first and foremost, this is such a unique issue with such a nuance and one that I have no experience with. The uh, you know, my only experience in courts is that the courts ran the courtroom and all of those uh, clerks, um, interpreters, transcription, the court was responsible. It's, a, it's an odd situation. And I, what I'm seeing is, what we're hearing is that it's split about 50-50 or, I mean, there's no predominant way to do that in Washington State, but we've heard, I mean, it impacts data entry with clerks, whether JAs do it or not. We have a new judge upcoming. We need to decide, well, do we have more clerks or more JAs? Uh, and it, the impact of on the jail with data coming to them late because of shortage of clerks not keeping up. I think it's a ridiculous situation. I mean, I, I would support having um, Basically, the clerk not an elected position. I think that solves, it, it makes it a lot simple, <laughs> more simple to uh, manage the courts and, and all of its processes. But I'm just one person, I'd like to move forward on it. My only hesitation is that there's gonna be so much on this coming ballot. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm the public, but anyway, those are my thoughts. Sue? I'd be interested in learning more about this. I'd really like to see a pro and con if, if there are potential savings, if there are efficiencies that could build, be built in. I don't know if the auditor's office has ever looked at the clerk's office uh, to examine any of that. Uh, there's not time really to do that at this point if we want to get something on the ballot. But in as much as we can be thoughtful in looking at the pros and cons of this, it's, uh, it's, it's not an area of my expertise, so I'd like to be as thoughtful as possible. Karen? I'd like to hear from the clerk as well as uh, the pros and cons, uh, and I think having that discussion would be very fruitful, so I'd like to see the discussion move forward. And Glenn. Yeah, I echo that. I, I would like to hear from the auditor. I'd like to, to know more about it, but certainly open to the discussion. Yeah. Okay, that works. Um, I did let um, our clerk know that this was being brought up today, and if council wanted to move forward with further discussion, he will be included, so he is aware. Um, so we'll get something um, scheduled next week as a holiday. So we may be squeezing in a short um, council time special meeting for that discussion so that if you decide you wanna keep moving forward, we have the time to do it. And you had other items on your list. Yes, I do, Chair. Two other items for you today. Um, so the first one, I got a call from the Washington State Office of Financial Management yesterday. They are managing the task force that was created um, via the budget process this last legislative session uh, for determining what to do with the large correction facility. Uh, and as part of 
uh, that efforts uh, statutorily in the budget. That task force is required to include one of uh, the county councilors. Uh, it is uh, misstated actually in the budget says county commissioners, but it is one of the county councilors. Uh, and also one nearby resident um, who lives near uh, the large correctional facility also to be appointed by the county council. And so um, just to give you a sense of timing, they would like to start having meetings in July. They are looking at their first meeting to be uh, the week of July 22nd. And uh, meetings will be every other month through next June, June of 2025. And so uh, I, I just wanted to raise this, this issue for council to see uh, who among uh, Council, uh, you know, how would you like to appoint a, a representative to this board or task force? And then also uh, just note that, um, you know, we'll need to get the process moving to uh, appoint a resident. Uh, I assume that probably will involve, you know, our typical appointment process with a, a press release and um, getting some applications and then moving forward with who council would like to, to see as that member. So my initial thought is as much as I'd love to be on this committee, I think it would be beneficial if we had one of the three counselors um, that will be here uh, throughout the entire process. And it is in your district, but um, Michelle's not here. But So you don't need an answer today, but are you volunteering? I, I would be interested in serving on that. It, it may actually be in District 4. I'm not quite, we were looking at the map. It's, uh, it, it's generally shared territory up there, but I'd be very interested in serving. Yeah, and, and so I harken, whether it's in 4 or not, I've flown over a, a lot, but uh, it would be beneficial to have one counselor throughout the entire task force process, I think, instead of splitting it, waiting for a new a rival counselor. Glenn. I, I'd be supportive of, of Sue taking that role. Okay, but I, I wouldn't want to cut Michelle out in case there is an interest. Can we can we hold off on that, or I mean, when do you need to when do we need to notify them who it is? Um, I mean, I think they would like an answer as soon as possible. Um, but they did only just reach out to me yesterday. I think they may have sent um, a, you know a couple of messages. Uh, a little bit ago, but but not to not to the right folks. So I, I think you know this is us kind of closing the loop. Um, so if if we needed to you know hold the discussion to next week, I think that would be fine. Well, let me ask Karen. What do you think? Um, I think it would be proper to uh, ask Michelle as well. So I'm I'm with you okay. on that. Okay. So. I think she's just temporarily not available today, so we'll Yeah, and I, I would suggest that um, when Jordan talks to her next, um, if she says no, we can just communicate to the council that Council Marshall, if she says yes, then we'll add, or what, that she's interested, we'll add it to the next council time, which is in two weeks. Yeah, and, and I would just say that my interest is that this is a largely, my district is largely rural. This is a rural area, and so I, I think I, Okay, you don't have a good representative. <laughs> Go easy on the campaign here. Did did you already talk to Michelle about this this I, week? I have not. No, this okay. uh, this I just got the call yesterday afternoon. So this is kind of my my first chance to bring this to y'all. All right. So I think we have a plan on that. Perfect. And additional policy update. One final item. I am extremely pleased to be able to tell council that today I got a signature on the Comcast ARPA broadband expansion contract. Uh, they have signed it. We are moving it through our process. Uh, and so depending on, uh, on the exact timing of that, we'll either have uh, that contract ready for council's consideration on the 18th or the 25th. So I will add, I signed the staff report within 15 minutes of getting it today. So <laughs> it's not held up on our end. I think uh, I've heard the phrase, it takes a village. <laughs> it takes a village to get a signature on them. All right. Man, I think we broke a record on how long that took. Well, and but, we did save a million bucks on this deal in the end. Yay. Okay, thanks for driving that. Of all the people that participated, including the PA's office, it was a long, 
arduous effort. All right, so we have two executive sessions, collective bargaining 9.1 for 10 minutes, and then 9.2, the pending litigation under RCW 42.30.110, paren one, paren little i, for 10 minutes with possible after action. So that's a total of 20 minutes. It's 25 minutes after the hour now. We'll give everyone five minutes to reconvene. So we'll come back at about uh, 10 of three. We got five. You have five, right? Now. It's clock's ticking. 2.50. Okay, we are back from executive session, which we held with our uh, attorney. Are there any motions? Yes, Chair. I move to approve the memorandum of understanding to resolve the matter of Pierce County at Al versus Washington State Department of Social and Health Services at Al filed in Pierce County Superior Court and give authority to the county manager to sign the associated documents. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Okay, further discussion on the matter. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Many opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. We stand adjourned. Have a good day.